Welcome to, uh, to Paul. Um, it's my great honor to welcome all of you tonight. Um, this is, uh, you wouldn't be in the room if you didn't uh, walk in here with your hearts. And uh, that's a greatly respected an institution like ours that has St. Vincent de Paul's name over the door. Um, in, his, uh, in his day and time, um, St. Vincent had to figure out how to rethink charity, because uh, the old version of one-on-one -on -one charity just wasn't working when um, whole, whole peoples were flooding um, the urban populace um, because of wars out in the provinces. Um, and so he had to, literally had to rethink, how do, you, how do you deliver healthcare to the poor? How do you do that? And how, do you, uh, how do you take care of people on large scales all at once? How do you do that? And how do you, uh, how do you reform the prison system? Because that just was putting people in a way they could never get out just because they were poor. How do you do that? And they had to think their way through extraordinary set of social issues and invent a whole new way of doing charity by the human community. Um, it has been the uh, it has been the great um, thinking in our time, well, literally for this past century, of the rise of the social sciences um, to think about society structures and how structures reinforce or aid um, people's well-being and their lives and their communities and their abilities to take care of their families and see to their own needs. And so as much as people are told individually, take care of this yourself, um, you're young, you're strong, with structures around them that absolutely get in the way of them. Um, and the word is used um, by theologians since then to reflect on the work of social sciences uh, to bring the idea of sin and grace into that um, for structures themselves. But of course, it's still human beings, isn't it? And it's people who gain by the structures and people um, who thereby lose by the structures that they can't control. And that has been um, the great insight of uh, people in our time to try to explain to us. But of course, all such insights are not just intellectual. They end up incredibly political. And they, uh, they, they have great consequences uh, for people who even raise the questions. Um, I, I, I bring that whole context that all of us in the room would know or you wouldn't have come this evening. Um, simply to introduce someone to you as my teacher. Um, but in fact, we just met for the first time 10 minutes ago. Uh, 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 Sabrino um, was my teacher um, 25 years ago, I think, when I first began reading his work. Um, when I was in the seminary, when I was studying for ministry, um, he opened a piece of the world to me that I, until then, had not fully appreciated. Um, and showed it to me its great complexity and in its implications for how we live together as a human community. Um, it literally changed the way I saw the world. Um, he and many of his colleagues. And so it is uh, with a fair bit of uh, um, pride and, um, and gratitude that we, uh, we welcome him here tonight so we can hear from him directly. Um, as you may know, he speaks on an auspicious um, moment in time because tomorrow um, will be marked um, the death of the Jesuit martyrs um, down in, uh, in his country. And he will leave Chicago, I believe at four in the morning, um, to head to the airport so that he can mark that moment um, in his own place. Um, which says something about him choosing to be with us tonight. Um, that, uh, that's an extraordinary commitment on his part. But his life has been an extraordinary commitment um, to the poor, to those who are affected by the world around us. And so I look forward to hearing what he has to say, but I am just incredibly grateful that he would take the time to continue to teach, continue to help us see the world, and continue to challenge our hearts so that we can rise courageously, bravely, um, and with the courage of our convictions to make a difference for those who can't always make a difference for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so it's in that spirit that I simply now turn and say bienvenidos, uh, Sabrina, to you. And thank you for joining us here. I have a text here for the data in Spanish. Uh, I will not read the text and certainly not in Spanish. I will try to speak uh, freely 
in English. My English used to be fairly good. Uh, these days, it's not that good, but hopefully I will, myself, I will make myself understood. And at any rate, I have a good friend here which uh, will help me out uh, in my English doesn't convey what I want. Why English, you would say? Uh, well, uh, more familiar uh, to speak uh, the language that all of us uh, have in common. Uh, and today, as you have been said, uh, we remember something which is very important for many of us, certainly for me and uh, for you. So in other words, today is, it wouldn't be uh, the day for me to uh, give a purely conceptual uh, dissertation. Do I make myself understood? Yes. Good. Yes. So you can do the rest of it it's needed. Uh, I will talk uh, from reality uh, from reality. It's, uh, the principle of reality is something which uh, philosophers think about that they had the chance to get to know and live with and work with Ignacio Ejakulia. And for Ejakulia, uh, one of the uh, concepts that are very important, they always come in second or maybe in third. And uh, trying to develop concepts from other concepts is important. But maybe with us not to do uh, a very important thing. Reality is the important thing. Oh. So I will talk from what I had best and not theological Christian, yeah. but has been given to me to you. Uh, that's the one, the first thing I want. The second one, I will make some reflections. Maybe sometime you might have the, the text in Spanish and in Now, the, the second thing I want to say is that uh, the word martyr, I will go into that word a little bit more conceptually also. But the word martyr is not any type of word. At least it connotes two realities for me. One is blood. Oh, that is there is no blood in the mud. There might be witnesses of something, huh? but Marcus is blood, shed blood. And uh, wait a second, I have a problem with my line. Yeah, yeah. Second, or, or first, if you wish, logically, connotes love. Do you see love around this planet? I don't know. It's, that's it's up for you to, to decide whether you see love or not. Uh, well, martyrs connote love, uh, love. And the second thing I want to say from the beginning is that martyr, although the word might sound a little bit exceptional, if you wish, esoteric, some strange thing, uh, it is not such an esoteric thing. 
in Latin America, and I imagine in other places, but in Latin, Latin America, there have been many, many, many martyrs. And who are they? Romero, yes, but somebody who, uh, Mike? Michael has talked about Bishop uh, Romero so very well, so I, I don't have to go into that again. Uh, Romero is fairly well known, uh, fairly well known. Don't think that very well known. Huh? Don't think that everybody in El Salvador today, well, certainly those who killed him, but not only those who killed him, even among young seminarians, believe it or not. Romero, as you say, is not very well known. Huh? That means that uh, to a certain degree or to a large degree, also the church, at least the Catholic church, is going downward. But anyway, besides Romero, and say Jacobia, there have been thousands of pests, uh, some workers, and a few also uh, people uh, like uh, lawyers, students, teachers, and so on. And there has there has been, I don't know if you know a lot about that. In El Salvador alone, uh, 16 or 17 priests, uh, members of the Catholic Church, have been assassinated. Uh, five sisters, one of them Salvadoran, and the other four nuns are better known to you, at least the nouns sound familiar. And two bishops. One are Bishop Romero and the other one uh, Bishop Ram. So Martus is not something anecdotal. It's not an exception. Right? And going further in the uh, simple analysis, huh? the Martus I have mentioned, the 16 degrees, Romero, the four not look in life and death to Jesus of Nazareth. Okay? For me, that's a, a very good thing to say because I think I have seen it and I have to. I have come to that conclusion. Okay? But not any Jesus of Nazareth. Okay? From the beginning, I want I want to say something which maybe maybe sounds a little bit. Uh, Candles. The Jesus of Luke, why Luke and not Mark and Matthew out or John? Because according to Luke chapter 6, Jesus said, Blessed are thou uh, uh, the poor, huh? for you I have good news. Huh? You are hungry, but you will eat. Huh? Uh, and you cry, but you will smile. But all of you, then to be you, to huh? now be alive. So, that Jesus of Nazareth, according to Luke, himself was and preached good news for some people, for that poor and small ones, and bad news for others. You understand, uh, and I don't, I, I will do it, I will be a pastor, right? preaching bad news uh, all the time, you go to hell, you know, hell is something that's just another question. Your, your founder used to say, well, hell, well, there is no such a thing, but anyway, but uh, the idea is not, is not to insult people just for the sake of it, but, or because you feel good, or you, 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 know, you feel better or superior to those you insult, that's not the idea. The issue is that Jesus of Nazareth had very, very hard and harsh words against certain people. And that's why, by the way, Jesus himself became a man. He was killed. You cannot go around saying those things and live long years and die in bed surrounded by righteousness. <laughs> well, you understand my language, right? Not only my English, but my language. So, okay. Now, we call, or I call, uh, I have to explain the word, I have been told, this type of people today who are killed, roughly, more or less, like Jesus, we call them Jesuanic martyrs, martyrs Jesuanic. 
So my people uh, who were very much like Jesus. They are known and loved among uh, our people. Huh? And they belong to the tradition huh? of Salvadoran song, Salvadoran church. Huh? But now the second important song, in my opinion, the, the most important one, if I can put this across. In Latin America, there has been a larger number of people living in Cuba. Far larger, not just two large groups. There have been six or seven bishops in Latin America being assassinated, which uh, none of them can. I cannot avoid being ironical. But I'm probably uh, in a conceptual mood. Uh, the problem of canonization comes later in the, uh, in the text. But, uh, And who are those people larger in number than bishops or nuns? Well, they are uh, poor people, poor people. Those who are below in history might be poor or very, very poor. They are the poor who have been assassinated, often in large massacres. Those of you who are familiar with El Salvador, at least you might uh, remember El Mozote, almost 1,000 people. Oh, it's awful. Sumpul, Sumpul is another massacre. Sumpul is a river which divides Salvadoran land from Honduran land. And within El Salvador, quite a few peasants, I don't know how many uh, want to leave uh, the place where they were because the, uh, the army, the official army, Escuadrones de la Muerte, Cuerpos de Seguridad, follow that squad, oh yeah, uh, Escuadrones de la Muerte, that squad, follow them, and they knew what is going to do. And they found themselves with the river. Some, I don't know how many, could swim. And many others could not swim. And certainly, the children could not swim. So why? They tried to go across the river. Some of them were um, shallow down, and others were killed on the other side of the river. But, uh, uh, and talking to someone today, he was so nice to give me a, a booklet on Acteal. Acteal is a place in Mexico for some years ago. There was another matter. What do I mean? Beyond Romeva and Yacuri, uh, thousands of people in El Salvador, in Guatemala, is about the same, or worse. Because in Guatemala, people not all oh, they are indigenous. And white people, in general, were used to despise indigenous people. So, uh, who are these people? Well, uh, first of all, mm, there are a multitude, so a large number of people. In them, people, uh, persons like Romero put their heart. So, Bishop Romero, of course, uh, I think he appreciated us Jesuits at the university. I think he did. He was a good friend. But his heart was among those hundreds of thousands of people. He had to uh, hear very often, and there are books in that, huh? uh, the complaints of wives, mothers, whose uh, husbands and children had been killed. And, well, uh, Romero, fantastic on that. But uh, what I want to stress is that in pe for people like Romero and others, uh, this large majority were at the center of their heart. And my comment now, simple and brief. During their life, they were oppressed, repressed, and massacred. Not all of them, but many, many of them. And in death, they are ignored. 
Romero is not even known. Huh? As Urias uh, uh, repeats, Urias uh, is a Monsignor, well, not a bishop, but uh, uh, Monsignor, Monsignor, and he still writes. He is 86 now, Urias was a very good, a very close friend of Romero. He says, Romero was, or is, is the most loved, beloved Salvadoran and most hated Salvadoran. I think he is basically right. Well, anyway, uh, those uh, peasants who died in massacres or out of hunger, huh? were, mm, didn't have name, didn't know what, nobody knew who used to live in El, um, El Sumpur. But in death, they are ignored. Yeah. I don't know how much you know. And, and you, you mean why I talk to you now, not because you are some, of course you can know. <laughs> you cannot know. I can't know how many million people have been assassinated in this planet. After globalization, which I think makes things worse, in my opinion. Huh? But anyway, that's it. Uh, not that we can know all that. But usually, what I want to say is we ignore You know, the type of reality we should study in some course at this little university. And what happened? In El Salvador, Monsignor Romero and Ignacio Yacuría gave them a name. And now they have a name. Maybe you have heard it, some of you have. And in Yacuria and Romero, in different situations, call them the crucified people. Well, it's important. For me, it's very important. Now they have a name. They are not, they are not those who, who do not exist. The crucified people. It's important because people means not only more than one, but more than a dozen and more than a thousand means a large majority. And crucified, of course, is metaphorical language. They don't get uh, crucified with nails on the cross. But it's a metaphor which conveys reality. These people get killed, innocently, unjustly, like this is it. And the word crucified also in the lips of, uh, of a priest like La Pia, and of a bishop like Romero conveys the idea this is a Christian thing. Yeah. Or both of them call those large majorities also the suffering servant of the other. And by the way, by the way, if people like a Yacuria and Romero and many others, and also the the women, you know the problem we have with women, I myself. Unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever you want to do, more male people were assassinated than female, but in those days, but, but also women. Uh, men and women were killed by the male and women because they took the defense of the crucified people. That's, uh, if you wish, conceptual. Uh, it's not a very deep concept, but anyway going beyond heart, right? trying to think things. Why was Jesus of Nazareth killed? Why did he die on a cross? Why? Now, of course, there is an answer which is true, but not, it's not the total truth. It was the will of the Father. Okay. Okay. Why was it the will of the Father? <laughs> Who knows? But this father, <laughs> this I don't know. I know what Paul says and John says and many of and, and the mystery that God was at the cross was something else. But why did Jesus of Nazareth, a good man, a just man, did up, end up at the cross? And this is in page seven, as I say. Was it that he made the option for the poor? Excuse me if I go around the uh, He made the option for the poor? Yes. Did he make only the option for the poor? No. Why do you say that? Because there are people, maybe ourselves, yes, who have made the option of the poor, and we do some good things to the poor. 
But if you read what the bishop of Pueblo said, that was, that was the end of the good trend, I think. The end, for the moment, the good trend of bishop. What the bishop of Pueblo said is, and we are going around the wheel and up the wheel. They say that God, God is God. We can go further than that. Uh, independently of uh, their personal and moral situation. Okay? So whether they are married in the church or not, in El Salvador, not married. Because it's very expensive to get married in the church. Middle class can get married in the church. Very poor people. It's true. I mean, that's the first thing I learned when I went to El Salvador. That many people in the countryside did not get married in the church. They didn't have the money to be uh, a feast to celebrate. You know, it's just something human. Not popular. Independently of their moral situation, of their personal situation. God, and now that's important. Uh, so independently of that, so what God does is going to be gratuitous. Grace. But not that grace, nobody understands what it is. Right? Yeah? And what does God do gratuitously? Two things. The, sec the first one is in, yeah. los defiende y los ama. I want a good translation. The first is that God defends them and loves them. Defends them. So actively, actively goes out of himself to defend them. Why, why do you have to defend someone? Defend from what? From uh, when you have enemies. And the bishops of Pueblo said, God defends them and loves them. Now, this is the option for the poor. What happens, I think, and I will exaggerate. Some people understand, and that's good, very good. We have to make the option for the poor. We have to love the poor, help the poor. Okay, that is real. By the very fact that they are poor. But we might uh, help the poor without having to fight against anyone. Okay? If poverty is only the lacking of things, and no one is responsible for that, because what? Well, Defending the poor means uh, that you have to be against against some other people who attack the poor. And those who defend the poor and uh, confront their enemies, what happens? They are prosecuted, defamated, insulted, and killed. And by the way, that's the ABC of the narrative gospel. So that's the Jesus was not killed because he was a, a, a I'm serious now, he was a nice man, he was, uh, to the poor, or even um, merciful or understanding with sin. That he was, and that's very important, huh? that we all try to imitate. But Jesus was killed because beyond that, he confronted the Pharisees, whatever, the historicity of the world. The Sadducees, the scribes, <coughs> and the wealthy, and certainly the high priest. So we can't do a So what am I trying to say? That people are uh, when we talk about Mark, when we talk about the people. Uh, we talk about those thousands of people. They are also the cause, the reason why individual people, the Jesuitic martyrs, get killed when they try to defend them. As Bishop Romero just did, I, think, I don't know if you quoted that sentence of the very, uh, the day before he was killed, he said, in the name of God. Romero really talked about God. And in the name of these suffering people, whose uh, clamores, whose claims, whose claims, cries, uh, 
bridge to heaven and then talk to the uh, 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 brother you belong to the same people and in the name of God you can do that so in the name of God I ask I beg you I order you I command you stop repression so did, it, did Romero help the poor? Obviously. Was he nice to, to, to the poor? No. But he went be. He confronted those who were the enemies of the poor. And that's why uh, the, the, the concept together, the Jesuitic martyrs are so because they have defended the crucified people. By the way, how much time do I have? No, don't tell me any uh, uh, as long as you want. <laughs> Very more minutes. I'm on page two. <laughs> now the point is the point is uh, and our world today. Uh, not uh, Salvador uh, with peasants massacre at Sintuola. Our world today. Uh, well, I read this. I mean, ironically, in our world today, as far as I know, others know more than I do about this thing. With or without globalization, that's something. With or without globalization, with or without celebration of my lingua, the my lingua, that's something fantastic. In 1915, I think, the uh, rate of poverty should have uh, decreased 50%. That was said uh, 10 years ago. Not Millennia is the word. OK. With no, Mundiales. Mundiales is uh, soccer. The World Cup. World Cup or Juegos Olympics. OK. That's, uh, and I uh, with Jornadas Mundiales de la Juventud. The world Youth Days. You know what it is. People go to Milan, they in, in Rio, of course, they want to get more than that. That's all. In all that, in, in the world I have described a little bit ironically, millions of human beings continue suffering injustice and innocently violent deaths in repression, wars, and massacres. And many more millions. Okay suffer slow death. That's why I, I began with the two ideas. Uh, blood and love. Eh? Well, blood is a symbol of death. Millions suffer slow death because of poverty. And the more we know about the world situation, and the more people like Chance Ziegler, I don't know if you've heard of him. Uh, it's an old man now. He was professor at I don't know, the University of Geneva in Switzerland, but that's a major difference. But he was Comisionado de Naciones Unidas. He was a commission by the United Nations. For the uh, food and the food. Well, he says uh, that children, children don't die out of hunger. They are assassinated. And he's correct and makes the point. Assassinated. Because today, the world, the world can solve the problem of this minimum uh, nourishment. Nourishment. OK, and so uh, there are many, many more details. Uh, Pedro Casaldaria, a bishop from uh, Brazil, born in Catalonia, Spain, from Brazil, uh, wrote rather recently, uh, maybe you can Today, there, there's more wealth in Earth, yeah. but there's also more injustice. Uh, 2,500 million people survive on Earth with less than two euros a day, and 25,000 people die every day of hunger, according to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. The certification threatens the life of 1,200 million people in 100 countries. The migrants are denied their fraternity, the ground under their feet. The United States builds a wall of 1,500 kilometers against Latin America, 
in Europe, in southern Spain, Africa, uh, I'm sorry, in southern Spain, builds a fence against Africa. All this is wicked, but intentional. Well, I don't know whether uh, uh, Casaldaliga has the exact figures or not. Right? So, uh, this is how right? These are the crucified people. And just uh, uh, since I come from El Salvador, in El Salvador, in 12 years of war, you might have heard this figure. 75,000 people were assassinated from both sides, so to speak, although it has been figured out that of the total, maybe 4% were killed by the uh, guerrilla movement and the rest by the government. That's what that's what by it. But that was, and then war was over. And people don't hear about El Salvador anymore, right? Maybe what? It doesn't exist El Salvador. As I said before, the crucified <coughs> people don't even have At least in the Korea Code, by name, crucified people. Okay. But in the last 20 years, since the peace accord in seven, in 1992, so roughly 20 years, many, many problems have of course, some improvement, some improvement, but 100,000 people have been assassinated. There are many things to say about it. The first one is profit. And I don't think I'm just uh, exaggerating. Why well, there are many, many, many problems with gangs? Uh, why are they gangs? That's another. Because there is a lot of the drug trade. Drug trade. And why are the drug trade so it's complicated? I think at the very, very, very end, it all ends up with those who accumulate big money. Huh? Mm. But anyway, whatever the last reason is, the crucified people in the southern, whether you want to talk it that way or not, that's by the way, not even in the south of this language is used. When Archbishop Romero died, many things. Well, okay. Yeah. Now, maybe I'm on page three. Some <laughs> conceptual, <laughs> conceptual distinctions. So, that's concepts more for people who are aware of the LG, uh, but I think they're important. It used to be said, it used to be said in general in the theology books when the theme of uh, martyrdom came up that martyrs were those who were killed in odium fide because, for some uh, understand that, not the young one, okay. <laughs> which means uh, those who kill, whoever, is because they hated uh, the Christian religion, the Catholic religion, to put it simply. Now, of course, uh, what I have described in the Salvador, as far as I know, nobody has been killed, not even Romero, who really believed in God and prayed to God and said wonderful things about God. Uh, not even Romero was killed in odium fide. He was killed like in Latvia in odium justice. There are things that other people can't stand. Why is it? Well, my dear original sin, huh? just to say something which means a lot and which means nothing. Right? But anyway, that's the way we human beings. So they kill them because not because of the hate of faith, but rather because of the hate of justice. Okay, now, uh, this is, a, you know, the theologians here. God Rammer, when he was 79, the year before he died, he was uh, asked to write an article in the journal of Confilium on Martin. And he wrote uh, four pages right away. Uh, and he said, uh, <coughs> Enfrentando este problema. Confronting this problem. Con confronting this problem of inodium fide, inodium justicia. He said, uh, say in good English, ¿Por qué no había de ser mártir? Why should a Monsignor Romero not be a martyr? 
caído en la lucha por la justicia. He was he fell in the struggle for justice. En una lucha in a struggle que él hizo that he made desde su más profundas convicciones cristianas. From his most profound Christian convictions. As Pat Brandon was saying, we all call Brandon. He was not a young liberation theologian or anything like that. But he was a man with census feeling. And he said, you tell me that from where is not a martyr? What type of faith do we have? What type of theology have we built? Huh? In which Romero cannot be a martyr. That's what he said now in the room. And he uh, showed, uh, again in the same article, a big surprise, speaking about Maximilian Kolbe. Uh, Maximilian Kolbe was Francisco. 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 You know the story. Uh, uh, well, you know the story of that man. Uh, wanted to be as mad to kill one of each ten people. How did you do that? One out of ten is okay. the practice that we used to use. To the kill. prisoners had done something wrong. Which the Nazis did not like. So we, we are going to kill one out of ten prisoners. And uh, they were in the line. And uh, Father uh, Maximilian Colbert saw that he was number nine. And the man who was number 10 was uh, a married male with silver and so on. So what he did, he changed her. So, fantastic. Now, Rainer comments. The Pope, I don't know whether it was John Paul II or one of the Pope, uh, canonized. Uh, Maximilian Kolbe was good, but not as martyr, but as confession. So the distinction between martyr and confession was in the So, What do I want to say? Uh, that people give up their own lives out of love so that they get killed after that's not good to be a martyr. Of course, you don't have to be very intelligent. <laughs> to read in the Gospel of John. But no, that's a greater love than he or she who gives his life. Well, uh, where do I do? So all I want to stress, talking today about the six Jesuits and the two women. Have we mentioned the two women? At the beginning, who were they? Selena. Who were they? Members of the two sons. At least we'll write about them okay? and say a few things about them. But usually, if they had not been working with the six Jesuit priests, they would be totally unknown. And as I said, and I insist on it, Romero and Curia gave them a name, of course, a general name, because they didn't know the names of the world. dozens of hundreds of thousands of people who have been killed. I mean, they are the people. And now another conceptual distinction, very easy. Another conceptual distinction. At times it is said, it is good, that the word martyr in English or in Spanish in Africa comes from the Greek, martyr, which means uh, will. It's in the title of the uh, book. Now I have asked myself the question, but not to be conceptual. Uh, are martyrs witnesses? Yes. Are martyrs give witness of love. Are they only witnesses? And I have said, no, they are more than they. What are they? Sacrifices. What am I trying to say? It is for you and for theology to come. Martyrs are not only those who, we, who with their death, uh, have all them. And give the backing or have, give evidence. Give evidence uh, to the first of Jesus. And those sacraments, those who make Jesus present in our Christian. That's what I want to say. It's uh, written here. And 
thinking of that, I came back to something that Yahudiya said uh, three days before Romero was assassinated at the university which had a, a mass. And the Yahudiya were more popular at the At the one moment, he said. Let's see. I don't know how to say this in good English. In, in Spanish, yes. Con Monseñor Romero, Dios pasó por El Salvador. With Monseñor Romero, God walked or passed through El Salvador. Is that giving witness? Yes, but it's not. May God bless him. A theological word for that would be sacrament. But that's not very important. I think. Now, okay, uh, how much time? 10 minutes? You can tell me. Now, in here, on page 5, I write on Jesuanic markers, individual to one piece that I have already mentioned it, so I will go into that again. But then, on page 6, let me see. If we finish here, uh, let me move and go a little further. Uh, try to explain a little bit more why talking about the crucified people. Yeah. I'm going to ask you a question, and you nod or not. Have you ever heard the expression, or, or is sounds new to you, the crucified people? What well, new to you? To now let me see in my company. To go from Odium Fide to Odium Justitia was a substantial advance. In theology, that was not the case. Huh? A martyr was somebody who was killed in Odium Fide. So to say a martyr can be and is, he or she who is killed in Odium Justitia it was a great advance going forward. But in my opinion, it's not yet the most fundamental advance. From a theological perspective. Theological means from the perspective of God. This advance, or I don't like the word progression, this progression, this development, development uh, consists, in my opinion, in naming. And naming with names which promote dignity, like uh, parentheses. For those who have studied Christology in Asia, uh, if uh, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth was not baptized as the Lord or anything like that. The name was given to him after the resurrection. And the Lord was one way of saying that man, Jesus of Nazareth, was a very special uh, man. The Lord is a name which gives dignity to that person. Is that true? Well, going back to the crucified. The crucified people were given titulos de dignidad. Titles of dignity. Names of dignity. Well, okay. And they were called the crucified people and the suffering servant of Yahweh. Remember Isaiah, uh, four sons of the, the servant of Yahweh. In the fourth one, it is uh, depicted uh, the suffering servant. So, the servant of Yahweh had his suffering state. <coughs> but then, uh, Yahudi also said that the, uh, the, the crucified people is the servant of Yahweh. And also Romero. And Romero, in one of his homilies, uh, he says he used to prepare his family, reading uh, good and normal uh, biblical explanations and the reading. And when he came up with this reading, the suffering seven, he went, I don't know to what book he went, but he said, how good it is, but I, I haven't been <coughs> how good it is, how nice it is that the biblical scholars don't agree with what? Something one way and something, something in a different way. Always in a different way. Something biblical scholars that the suffering servant of Yahweh, which was not a real historical figure, might be a whole people. Or 
the future of Jesus Christ. Well, the, uh, the nice thing about Romero's comment, he didn't make, he didn't solve the, the biblical problem or gave his opinion. But how nice it is. Uh, then with the, the same word, we can think of Jesus of Nazareth, which will be uh, our Savior, or his birthday. Uh, and I'm trying to say, for Jacqueline and for Romero, uh, the suffering servant of Yahweh was lucky. The ten thousand. And then of course well that is that I read my talk I don't know if you maybe we can think of it. How is the uh, the suffering servant of Yahweh described in the same in chapter fifty two and fifty three? Maybe you can tell me. Well I have just written down some some things that the prophet Isaiah or whoever the prophet the second Isaiah found in that suffering servant. He says, El pueblo crucificado. Well, the, uh, the suffering servant is Barón de Dolores. Man of sorrows. Acostumbrado al sufrimiento. Acquainted with grief. Es despreciado. He is despised. Desfigurado. Disfigured. No parece hombre de human being. He no longer looks like a human being. Y muchos se espantan de él. And they need are horrified by him. Así lo dejan las torturas. That's my comment now. Right? Today, today. This is how the tortures have left them. Yeah. When you see the crucifix, the real crucifix of people, I don't go into detail. But some of producen espanto y asco. They produce horror and disgust. Muchos se espantan de él. Many are frightened by him. That's a okay. Y ante él se ocultan los rostros. Before him, they hide their faces. No, my comment. Porque da asco verlos. Because it is disgusting to see them. Y, my comment, para que no enturbien la felicidad del mundo de abundancia. That they may not cloud the happiness of the world of abundance. No, my comment. Sufrimiento, horror. Desprecio. Suffering, or disdain, Olvido. disregard, insult, insult, negación hasta de su religiosidad, denying even their own religiosity. The peasants in the South were called captives. And some of them were very few. They didn't know who came out with. But calling somebody what we were called, somebody who came out He said that the, the peasants did not even know who Karl Marx was. But, but to call somebody communist was to insult somebody and to say, you are in great danger, then somebody will kill you. Now my, my general comment. Todo eso lleva en su carne hoy el pueblo crucificado. All that is carried in their own flesh today, the crucified people. And, también como ocurre hoy, just as it happens today, Del siervo dice Isaías lo follow. Of the servant, Isaiah says the following. Le dieron sepultura con los malvados. They buried him among the wicked. That was something terrible, terrible, right? But to bury some, somebody, some human being, among sinners or something. And my comment, aunque hoy los desaparecidos, although the missing, Y los cadáveres botados en basureros y cementerios clandestinos. And the bodies dumped in landfills in clandestine cemeteries. That's what happened today. Ni siquiera han tenido tumba y epitaph. They have had no grave and no epitaph. They have not been buried among sins, which is awful. Huh? We don't even know who the top is buried. And as you know, uh, maybe I think it's Antigona. Antigona uh, fights for the... Uh, the post of his uh, the, 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 what, the old people yeah. they were limited but in, in certain things they were a little more human and uh, a corpse was something sacred so let's go on and finish del siervo dice Isaías of the servant Isaiah says no abría la boca como cordero llevado al matadero he did not open his mouth the lamb led to the slaughter. Come. 
Hoy sí hay grupos que defienden lo que es de derechos humanos. Today we do have groups that defend, like such as uh, human right organizations. Pero la mayoría del cuerpo crucificado no abre la boca de los que mueren, o sea, de los que mueren en las masacres. But the vast majority of the crucified people no abre la boca. open their mouths. Most of them because they are already dead, but because they are relatives. They're so scared that they talk to them. <coughs> Del siervo dice Isaías. Of the servant, as he says. Se lo llevaron sin defensa y sin justicia. They took him without defense and without justice. Esto ocurre. This occurs. También hoy. Also today. O ha ocurrido en estos años. Or has occurred in the last few years. En total indefensión. With a massive death. In total helplessness and powerlessness. And finally, the servant says Isaiah is innocent. Of the servant, Isaiah says that he's innocent. No hubo engaño en su boca. There was no deceit in his mouth. Ni había cometido crimen. Nor had he committed any crime. What I say, Isaiah, what I'm trying to say is that when Romero and Ejaculia use this expression, the crucified people, the suffering servant of Yahweh. They are not, they were not, uh, they were not naive. naive. They knew of the problems of the sins of the crucified people. But in general, put together, compared to the other sufficient, that's what they say about the crucified people. And uh, the very, my last, oh, I have to. I think this is true to the present time. And I have I asked myself rhetorically, ¿Qué pecado han cometido los indígenas de Guatemala quemados dentro de la iglesia de San Francisco en Huehuetenango? He asked himself, what sin have the indigenous of Guatemala who were burned within the church of San Francisco in Huehuetenango committed? Los campesinos asesinados en el Mozote. What about the peasants killed in el Mozote? Los niños famélicos o muertos en África. About the, the children who had died of starvation in Africa. And as I mentioned before, somebody gave me a book. I don't remember exactly what happened in Acteal in Mexico. Huh? Another barbarous act. What have they done? Bueno, entonces, eh, that's what I wanted to Today, see, November 16th, we remember the uh, month. Some of them are well known in the Kudia Nazi Martin Baroc because he studied here. But otherwise, the same stuff. But anyway, but I, wa I have wanted to add a different type of, I don't call them markers anymore, Mar just learning markers, not to bring confusion with the language. But I call them, or we call them, the crucified people, the suffering servants. Uh, that's what they wanted to say. And to the end, my last reflection is the following. Uh, why do I say this? El Salvador, if you've been there, if you go down there, it's a wonderful country, it's a terrible country. It's a place of human beings more important than being one to the But in El Salvador, things like those which I have described have succeeded, they have been real. But, uh, and that's my last, my last comment. I don't know if that has happened in other places. It's not important whether in other places it hasn't happened that way. But in itself, to me, I was giving uh, class in Cristo, uh, yes, maybe. And I remember uh, the passage of, well, it's not, it's not it. Once John the Baptist was put in jail, Jesus of Nazareth stopped him. Is that a good understanding? So John the Baptist in jail, uh, while well, it's not still a, a big market, later he was beheaded. But 
Um, I was very intrigued by your notion, if I understood it correctly, that if as Christians we want to defend uh, the poor, uh, we cannot simply fight for the poor, we have to fight against someone. Um, uh, how can we someone. Those who give death to poor. And how can we know those who give death to poor? Um, I think there's a tendency, which I saw especially in my own research on Vatican diplomacy, but generally among other ecclesial entities as well, that it's very easy to criticize um, on a general level. So we criticize those who oppress, those who do injustice. Um, we criticize capitalists, communists, relativism. But it's much more difficult theologically, politically, and empirically to do the naming, to do kind of to allocate the specific responsibilities. Um, what is your question? So how can we know? How can we know those? Um, Study reality, not necessarily at certain universities, at certain, that's something else. There are hundreds of uh, learning institutions in the world, right? Not only in Moscow or Prague, huh? at the UCA, for example. The Yakuria never wrote about against uh, church, never defended Stalin, nothing of that. No, he didn't. He showed uh, who was responsible not to the name. The, the social class, the oligarchy, those who have accumulated through the years of centuries the money, the land. And he knew very well. I mentioned that to here because you can say that he was done for the uh, uh, He criticized, he criticized uh, the gorilla whenever they made unjust things. He did. At the end, he worked for peace. Not because he said, uh, it's not clear who is unjust. He knew very well where the origin of injustice came in the Salvador. Huh? But he said, uh, only fighting, only fighting, what are we going to get? A totally destroyed and massacred country. Therefore, since he was a human being, with or without the Vatican State, because he was a human being and a Christian, he said, let's try to put, to bring peace into this country so that people don't get killed each other. He knew how difficult it was. The gorilla thought at one moment that they had enough power to defeat military, uh, the, uh, the official army. A Yakubi, uh, the intelligence used, the Yakubia used his in intelligence to tell the gorilla, the left, that they don't have enough power to overcome the other one. That is beyond ethics. Of course there is also ethics. But this fact, reality. The other one didn't want dialogue because he said, how are we going to uh, dialogue with Marx? Huh? They had dialogue with the devil, if necessary, to make money. They had dialogue with those, uh, I don't want to go into that, uh, those who went to Vietnam and came back from Vietnam uh, and to uh, Iraq and Iran. But uh, I'm trying to say, do we? I think we know something. Maybe we don't know the whole thing. We have to work hard and study as much as we can. We have university institutions to go deep into that, but not, I have heard that nobody knows exactly what I have seen. Okay, that's Thank it. you. Thank you. Identify yourself, Say who you are. Oh. Hello, uh, my name is Andrew Gallardi. I'm a student at Loyola University here in Chicago. Uh, my question was, um, with the idea that God has a special plight, or a special a presence in the plight of the poor, um, does suffering serve a purpose in the world? And if so, what is it and is it necessary? Now, may, I ask, uh, may I give a very, very good answer? And don't laugh. Ask God. <laughs> but 
I can make a comment. <laughs> if you open the Bible, which is the word of God for those of us who come from the Christian tradition, right? if you go into uh, the book of Exodus, you may remember, you know, God, we are in a Christian institution, right? Catholic. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, Moses was in Egypt and saw, and then, but however does God does it, I don't know. Anyway, it is written that, that God told to Moses and told him why. I have seen the suffering of the people. I have heard, that's all the metaphors here, and Dr. Moshe, I have seen, I have heard the uh, paramodis, the cries, the, the cries that the oppressors, the enemies, yeah. they arran arrancan a los slaves. They have taken away from the slaves. No, not taken away. It has uh, provoked. Uh, mm -hmm. So I have heard, I have heard the cry. Therefore, I have made a decision. I, God, whether popes, bishops, pastors, protestants, Marxist, Lenin, that's something else. I have made a decision. I will go down to the world. That is clear. That's just reading the Bible. What does, what does that mean completely today? Well, that's, well, that's something else. It's the same thing as making an effort to see how to liberate today people who are excluded, uh, enslaved, and so on. So that, that's, that's my answer. You might, one might believe or disbelieve, accept or not accept that God. That's perfectly reasonable, yeah? I think, in principle. In some countries who belong more to a Christian, Catholic tradition, might seem a little bit even arrogant for me to think that way. In other countries like France today, yeah? in these countries, most of Spain, Little by little, uh, forgetting God. Uh, this is a fact. Uh, maybe this might make no sense. Why does not do that? Uh, why God does or doesn't do that thing? But at least uh, to me and to people like Romero and Maria, you know, I say that one thing. And the crucified people, they wouldn't be able to repeat the words. God said that. Uh, thank God. Uh, but they understand that God is with them, not because they are very good. They know the wrong things they do. <coughs> but they know that they are, that God is with them because they are poor. Because he said that they will be with them. That's my comment. Uh, Bill Mullen, a married old priest, worked uh, 40 years in, in Guatemala. And I just want to uh, Thank you for mentioning the people in San Francisco and don't, because I was a pastor there for seven years and I personally knew all those Mayan Indians who speak Chuk who, who were massacred. Uh, and it, it just confirms to me, I think one of your major statements is that the, the crucified people, the martyrs, live. You cannot kill them. And and their witness, you know, the Jesuits and, and they the cook and the young lady, Romero, I'm, I'm just repeating what you said, that they live and, and they do affect what's happening in the world. They point out to the injustices. They they point out to to the horror of of of, of, of how the dominating and people treat the the, the outcasts, the, the people don't mean anything to the world, they don't mean anything to business, they don't mean anything to governments, but they live. And, and they're the ones I think that, uh, I, I just think they're great people. And they're still alive. Okay, thank you. Again, I mean, for a walk. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to ask one more question, I thank you by the way, but you have said all of it. 
and Julia could be affected or Guatemala because this is close to me geographically and also yeah, everything is true. Right? Have you ever heard that Christianity has something to do, something to do with being crazy? <laughs> have, you read, have you read Dostoevsky, one of those great? The great well, that's the type of expression. You know? uh, okay. um, Craig Gould, I work at the Catholic Theological Union here in Chicago. And I'm also the father of three young girls. And just as a parent, you know, I want to know what advice would you give to raise, to raise our girls with a heart for the poor? I don't know if you live in this country. I, I don't know. How old are you? They're four, three, and one. Okay. Just love them. <laughs> love them and in the long run try to, to be good. So convinced that the path of Pacaro is of the massive of Romero, the marches of San Francisco, you have to be a little bit. That's the correct path. Difficult, not obvious. Your children will not understand it. And they get a little bit older in high school. Maybe, maybe, maybe their teachers might uh, laugh at them. <coughs> so be ready to counter that with conviction and with a conviction that is worthwhile leading you yourself that way and giving that type of life and not up to your children. So my dear friends, thank you.